Hi, my name is Nathan Kenny. I'm currently an MBA candidate at Columbia Business School. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with Lu Zhang, who is an F50 Global Committee member and the founder and managing partner of Fusion Fund, uh, an early stage venture capital firm in Palo Alto. Today we're going to be discussing tech trends after the pandemic. Uh, we're in a very unique time right now, as, as everyone's experienced over the past few months, but especially over these last few weeks, we've all seen that we have started to see signs of emerging from this pandemic, even if only temporarily. And so uh, it's a really interesting time to take a look at what sort of happened over the past few months and to look at what the future might hold. And along those lines, I'd like to um, get your take, Lou, on uh, what's happened over the past three months and specifically with regard to the startup and venture capital community, some of the impacts you've seen, and then we can move into a discussion um, about what the future might look like. So thank you very much for joining me today. Yeah, thank you, Nathan. Uh, so just to get started um, and taking a look back uh, as an investor over the past three months, what are some of the biggest impacts that you've seen take place? And, and what are some of the industries specifically that you've seen impacted and how have they responded? Yeah, so definitely, you know, lots of people already find out that most of the consumer company actually got hit a lot for the past couple months because of the shelter in place order and also the pandemic. Besides that, especially the traditional sector, which requires lots of offset, uh, onsite uh, working support are suffering as well, reach out visits, et cetera. So I would say it's very important for us to look at uh, which industry actually suffers the temporary, which one actually got a strong push by this pandemic, which exaggerate the problem, the critical problem they have for a long time. For example, for some traditional sector, we can realize that for the past many years, although we have so many new technology innovation being invented from Silicon Valley across US, across the world, they still haven't adopted new technology. So the efficiency problem is pro uh, it's a big issue. And also digitalization process haven't got started yet. So when the world is changing and the new things come in, they're pretty fragile under this pandemic. And uh, meanwhile, for other sector, for example, we see some retail business got hit. On one side, it definitely helped push of the digitalization process moving everything online. But on the other side, it's also a temporary thing. Once uh, after the pandemic, everything opened up, the economy may, uh, uh, may recover a little bit for that specific sector. Certainly. So I know that a lot of um, you know, industries have felt really negative impacts, of course, and it's been a really trying time for a lot of them, and, and it probably will continue to be in the short term. But on the flip side of that equation, what sort of opportunities do you see as emerging from this pandemic? And how do you think that founders and startups more broadly can position themselves to take advantage of these opportunities? Yeah, definitely. Every time when we talk about the huge, uh, huge problem, risk and changes, we, which always come along with big opportunities, even for now, regarding you previous asked about, you know, the industry got impact, the VC and the startup community also got impact. We saw much less VC are deploying capital to early stage companies and the Funders are having a harder time to raise money. But on the other side, we always talk about the long term is the best time to invest in early stage tech company. On one side is the concentration of the ABC capital. The top 10% of company probably will get more high quality capital for support. And meanwhile, whoever survived the pandemic will see the market come much less competitor uh, from the competitive landscape. And which means they have much higher chances to become the market winner and also could experience the rapid growth of the business revenue and market share. So that's regarding the ecosystem itself. And besides that, in terms of general trend in the uh, micro industry, we can see this pandemic definitely push people has to do digitalization transformation, no matter for tech company or non-tech company. For example, for the comparison of East Coast and the West Coast, uh, why West Coast uh, have such a smooth transition between like, you know, before pandemic and the work from home because they had the infrastructure ready to support the diverse work from home, work remotely, future of work format. And they also have the infrastructure to support the digitalization platform for employee have the flexibility to work remotely to support the visits. But on the other side, you saw lots of traditional sector in the East Coast, including, for example, finance industry, finance service industry, insurance industry, even pharmaceutical companies they have to really push themselves, quickly adopt some new solution in order to build on top of their existing infrastructure to push the internal digitalization. That's a challenge for them, which also means a huge opportunity for startup founders. We already saw that happen. For example, 
we have a couple companies, no matter they're providing AI powered Nanko platform solution for finance industry or just NLP solution for remote deployation for the pharmaceutical company, or maybe like a, a virtual cloud solution for the like Intel manufacturing company. All this company, what we saw is they have rapid growth of revenue in Q and Q2 this year. Several of them already had the total amount of revenue of Q1, even more than the whole year of 2019. So that's one big opportunity coming up. We've been talking about digitalization for so long. And finally, with the crisis, people realize the problem of low efficiency internally, realize with so much data we generate, we haven't used it well to realize the value of the data and how to integrate the better tool, how to quickly adopt a new technology to help them utilize the data. So I think that's all bring on top of the table and for people to realize it is an urgent and a critical issue to be resolved and also big opportunity for the founder to work on it. And meanwhile, another thing for pandemic definitely is related to healthcare. I've been working on healthcare when I was an entrepreneur, uh, working at my own medical device company. I was investing in healthcare from day one when I started to do investment. So I do have a passion for healthcare. In total, healthcare industry accounted for 20% of US GDP. But with this pandemic, people all complain about the low efficiency, rapid growth of the patient, why we don't have better diagnostic devices, better diagnostic solution, much faster approach for people to get help. So with 20% of US GDP, we deserve better. So uh, from one side, we saw more capital are asking me, I have many friends from VC that are asking me, Lou, how could I invest in healthcare? Where are the opportunity? And once, on the other side, I also saw lots of the good AI and healthcare company. They're also uh, getting lots of attention, getting lots of revenue, much faster adoption, even FDA is changing as well. So that's another big opportunity, especially focused on diagnostic technology. Yeah, no, I think that's really exciting. Like you mentioned, within healthcare specifically, there's been a lot of momentum, of course, behind telemedicine and um, remote patient monitoring and things like you said that have been uh, historically very slow and inefficient and had, you know, been needing to change for a long time and that have finally gotten the push that they need, um, even if it is in these unfortunate circumstances. In addition to some of those trends that we've really seen accelerate over the past few months, what other trends have you seen, whether in healthcare or other industries, um, significantly accelerate that might have taken, you know, years had it not been for our current situation to be brought about? And which of these trends do you think will continue to have lasting impacts? once we sort of emerge into a post-pandemic world? I think one thing definitely need to be highlighted is the future for work. Future work has been one of the focus for VC to invest for the past couple of years. And with this pandemic, definitely, as you mentioned, uh, all of a sudden people has to adopt no matter tools, platform, in order to accommodate the future for work format. And uh, also you heard all the news that lots of tech companies in Silicon Valley are talking about allowing the employee to work from home, even like uh, infinitely not necessary just to till the end of the pandemic. And tech companies are planning to build up more remote offices uh, to, to have more flexibility in terms of future of work. So this is something uh, definitely got pushed. Another thing still same as what I mentioned earlier is the digitalization process. Digitalization is the main thing for this trend of uh, this time, this time of the technology trend. All the technology tools, edge computing, NLP, deep learning, everything is to help individual to realize the digitalization transformation to help industry and the enterprise to uh, realize uh, this potential. But it was very slow. Uh, every time, for example, if we look back to the history back in 2008, it's the financial crisis push everyone to the cloud. So cloud computing got accelerated in that one year. So this time is the pandemic push the digitalization process and also future of work. Um, but back to future work, another thing I do want to uh, mention also regarding your question about which trend might not be that uh, uh, be as big in Zoom as people imagine is uh, remote working. Although I know everyone is stopping Zoom platform remote working method during this pandemic, uh, still, you know, uh, the dynamic of in-person interaction uh, uh, still is very different from Zoom interaction. I, I would totally agree, you know, for example, corporate will be more open-minded in terms of using remote Zoom or remote collaboration platform for uh, enterprise sales, for ongoing conversation. 
but eventually it could now totally replace in-person interaction. So I think that should be the correct expectation of how fast the society could adopt the new format of using technology. Typically, we adopt technology through different stages. The first stage is you adopt the technology itself, but technology is integrated with your existing, you know, for example, li living uh, lifestyle of your regular pattern of working. And the next step is the technology change your pattern of working pattern of uh, life, but it will take some time. So I think now this pandemic definitely push us to adopting technology. We're at the stage one, but from stage one to stage two, it will take many years. Definitely. It'll be really interesting to see how these things play out in the coming months and years. Mm -hmm. uh, so another question I had for you is, you know, I know you briefly touched on it earlier, but you, you said yourself were um, a founder uh, and an entrepreneur not too long ago, and reflecting upon your time uh, on that side of the equation, what advice do you have for founders uh, going forward? I'm, you know, they've certainly faced uh, uh, numerous challenges over the past yeah. few months. It's been really difficult, but uh, as they're thinking about their strategy and you know their business model going forward, what sorts of changes do you think they need to make to adapt to a post-pandemic world? Yeah, definitely. I think lots of founders are asking me are, uh, whether now is a good time to start a company or not. Whether they should do it now, I'll wait till later. Uh, so I, my general, quest, general response is uh, there are no perfect timing. Even for this pandemic, as I mentioned, you know, it's definitely going to be bad news for some existing player, you know, much harder to fundraising and also less capital available. But on the other side, when we talk about less capital available, it's because VC are slowing down in terms of investment pace, but they still have tons of cash on hand. There are still billions of dollars came to VC in the Q1 this year, and there are money available looking for good funder to, to invest. But the challenge part is, as I mentioned, the pandemic and also the in general, the starting of the recession period, the downturn are changing behavior and the preference of investor. So it's very critical for funder to always be versatile, flexible to change their expectation, and align their expectation, and also knowing we, what they should expect in the next one or two years. Come talking back to the fundraising environment, for example, maybe in 2017, investors are okay, or maybe they prefer VC, a preferred founder uh, uh, pursue hyper growth, a founder to raise tons of money, burn the cash, and get quick user acquisition, and uh, expand the business across the nation within one or two years. That's the type of business was favored back in 2017. But if we look at now, you know, lots of VC, even they were preferred type, that type of founder. Now they're fine tuning their investment strategy. They were looking for founder, even they may invest a tons of capital. They still want founder be better at cost of control, cost of reduction, better at cash flow management and also able to understand how to adjust the business model to be able to generate blood themselves and be the survivor of this, you know, a pandemic uh, of this recession downturn period. And then they will pick the winner and put in the capital. So as I mentioned, yes, the available capital in the market actively investing might be much less, but in total, the general cash in VC industry is still quite a lot. So we'll see maybe in the next couple of months, the next half and two years, the top 10% of the company will got more concentrated VC investment. But on the other side, the rest of 90% will have a really hard time to raise money. And compared with that, if you look back in 2017, we joke about everyone got funded. So it's much easier to raise seed round, A round, but much harder for growth stage. Now, even for the earlier stage, we'll be more selective. So that's the change of the market dynamic. That's also very important for founder to realize that, to be able to uh, collect other information based on the market situation to do a uh, uh, timely adjustment of the company strategy. And another thing, as I said, is there are no perfect timing. Although the funding environment is changing, but on the other side, you know, during the downturn, why won't we talk about a great company in the history when you trace back, you found them what's funded in the downturn? Because during downturn, lots of players were, were gone. It's hard, it's a survival game. So very few companies gonna be the survivor. So eventually the founder gonna see much less competitor on the market. Used to be 10 or 20 companies to share the total market. 
now maybe only ends up with four or five. And each of them could grow to a major player, influential player to become the leader in the near future. And the, the growth rate of the company might be much faster compared with the okay normal year. So that's a great opportunity for founder. So that's the reason you probably heard that, oh, maybe downturn is a good time for founder to start a company as well, while it's super challenging. And to the end, I would also suggest the founder, no matter you're, you're considering the timing, et cetera. Don't, become, don't start a company if you're not ready. When, when we're talking about ready is your own expectation of the timing and also your evaluation of what's gonna happen and also compare that with your own personal situation, whether you could handle this situation, whether you could really go through this uh, survival game and be the survivor. And meanwhile, another thing is uh, no matter good time or bad time, only founder, super determined with what they want to do, passionate about the, about the technology and the product with strong insights of the industry they want to work on, will eventually have chances, have opportunity to build up a successful company. So take it seriously, really think it through seriously before you start a company. I think that's some great advice. Um, certainly a lot to think about and a lot of moving parts right now. Uh, one question I'd just like to end on, and, and I know you touched on some of this in your last response, but um, as you said, a lot of founders are, are really trying to figure out that if this is a good time to, to start a company. There are certainly advantages to our current climate, but there are also a lot of obstacles. So is there any specific piece of advice you'd like to leave with founders who uh, are pretty sure that they're ultimately going to take the jump in and try to start their company in the next few months? I would say that there are tons of advice and uh, suggestions I would give, um, but I consider my experience as a former entrepreneur, I probably will give some very practical tips. So for example, now you'll probably talk with, the uh, founder probably talk with lots of VC, but the VC are slowing down on their investment pace. So founder may feel like, okay, you're not actually investing, why am I talking to you? Well, now as a founder, I totally understand that feeling that you want to get things done quickly and get back to the work. But now I in general give founder suggestion that use every opportunity to talk with investor at a free consulting session. It will totally change your mindset and also perspective, which type of question to ask, how to interact, engage with the investor, and how to make the most from your interaction and time with the VC. And meanwhile, you know, uh, actually things are getting better. I remember back in Q1, Q2, we were one of the few VC firms still actually looking for investment target on the market. Lots of VC, they are running out of money or either are pausing their investment pace or waiting for the opportunity. Now they're coming back. We have uh, this list of active invest, uh, investor uh, in the early stage and we can see the list is getting longer and longer. So I would say, you know, keep regular engagement with uh, investor you're talking to. Even now they're slowing down, but uh, when they're ready, if you keep them uh, warm already, they will be looking out for you as a target uh, on the front line. And another thing is, you know, as I mentioned about the timing of the market, insights of uh, industry, uh, really think about what is the special differentiation and advantages for you to start a business. Maybe put in a different way that you want to work on a company, you have not only unique advantages, but also you have unfair advantages. Not necessarily only technology, but potentially connection or timing partnership you can leverage to start it. Especially now, you know, we talk about survival game. So you have to, if you start, you have to run very, very fast in order to become the survivor and ultimate winner. So really think it through and think about your differentiation, the talent differentiation, strategy, business model, technology, product, and then to get started. And the, the, to last, and maybe my last piece of suggestion is about uh, relate to the trend we're talking about. This trend, the same as digitalization of the industry of enterprise. So it's very different from the last uh, technology trend talk about disruption all the time and like use internet, all this new technology, disrupt the old player and replace them. This time it's not about the replacement, it's about the empower, it's about the integration. So for any founder are doing a company right now, you for sure more or less, especially for B2B, you need to interact with a traditional player, existing player. You want to become their vendor supplier. You want them to become your client. So really think about how to better make your platform and solution easy for integration and easy for your potential client to partnership together with you. Sometimes industry does not necessarily need the best technology. They need good enough technology, low cost, 
better, cheaper, faster, and meanwhile, easy to integrate. You're empowering them to improve the efficiency and become the market leader. And eventually you together with your client to replace the existing leader in the industry. That's when disruption and the, uh, and the replacement happen. As a, for example, I normally talk about in healthcare sector, it's not AI gonna replace doctor. It's doctor who use AI as a tool gonna replace the doctor who refuse to use new technology. It's a nurse and also hospital system who integrate with the edge compute platform will replace the old fashioned hospital system. So that's the key message of this uh, critical part of this technology trend, but that's also a great opportunity for lots of under to work out. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really exciting time, especially for companies like that, that you mentioned. It's, it's, um, it's been a really interesting discussion, Lou, and I, I really appreciate you sharing your perspective with us. I um, you know wish anybody founding a, a company in, in these circumstances, best of luck, but uh, knowing you know that there are people out, out there like you that uh, are, are wonderful resources for founders and entrepreneurs is certainly reassuring. So um, thank you again for your time. Yeah, thank you, Nathan.